Welcome back. Let's continue working on our giant mushroom. The first thing I'm going to do is apply a base coat of white paint. Without the white base coat, the blue color of the XPS foam could cause a color shift on the final paint color. This is especially important if you're going to use transparent inks. Casting a foresight spell, I can tell you things didn't go as I had planned. I was planning to use transparent fluorescent ink but ended up going a different direction. I think you'll like the result. I'll add a link to the inks I used on most of my other mushrooms. I'll try to make a video showing the process I used to paint them too. I applied the ink with an airbrush which I know a lot of crafters have not invested in yet. These are small foam beads that I bought at the Dollar Tree. I keep them in an old peanut butter jar to make them easier to handle. Well, that was easier. Not so much. While I collect them all back together, I'll tell you what we are going to do. I'm going to cut them all in half with a sharp X-Acto knife. These are going to be the small white bumps on the mushroom caps. This batch of mushrooms are going to be modeled after the Amanita, which is a genus of fungi that includes about 600 species of agarics. Some of these mushrooms are toxic, while others are edible. I'm pretty sure mine are going to be toxic. More specifically, I'm shooting for a look similar to the fly agaric mushroom. I won't bore you with the tedious process of cutting them all in half, but let's just say they are very lightweight. Your breath is enough to blow them around on the table, so take shallow breaths while doing this step and try not to pass out. Whatever you do, don't sneeze. Next I'm going to place a dab of tacky glue in my paint tray. Did you see the dots blowing around with my breath? I wasn't kidding. Placing the dots is easy enough just poke them with the X-Acto knife, dip them in the tacky glue and poke them onto the mushroom cap. As I got more and more dots applied, I noticed it was getting harder to hold the cap without bumping dots near the edges. A small toothpick or skewer poked into the bottom of the cap will give you a nice stable handle to hold onto while finishing this step. Did you know they call the small bumps on the caps of mushrooms scales? Maybe some mushrooms have a bit of draconic blood in them. Only squeeze out a small dab of the glue at a time. The tacky glue lives up to its name. If you leave too much out for long enough, it will form a skin on the glue, which makes it hard to apply to your dots. The skin will pull the dot off of your knife, and you'll have to fish it out of the glue. This isn't ideal since we have a lot, and I mean a lot of dots to apply. At this point, I want to talk about the placement. The small cap I applied a lot of scales fairly close to each other. This is fine as I imagine that each mushroom cap is born with the same or similar number of scales and as they grow the scales become more and more spread out over the top of the cap. On the larger caps I place them more widely spaced. This has two advantages. First it means we need to apply fewer scales and I consider that a win. Second it means that on the flat top of the cap where minis need to stand, we have enough open areas to allow the mini to remain relatively flat and stable. When I'm making my terrain, I'm always trying to keep playability in mind. It's always a balancing act between play and aesthetics. When the two are mutually exclusive, I try to err on the side of making the terrain playable. Now it's time to attach the caps to the stipes or stems if you prefer. There are a lot of ways you can create the hole in the cap for the stipe to insert into. If you have a handheld hot wire tool, you could use the probe tool to melt a hole. Because these tools are made to cut foam without melting it too much, they may take a bit of time to open up a sufficiently large hole. You could just use an Zacto knife and carve out the hole that way. It would be a perfectly reasonable way to achieve this, but it's kind of messy and again it will take some time. Since I have a soldering iron, I'm going to use it. This is an old iron I don't use for electronics, so I don't care if it gets messy. If you look carefully, you can see the nib isn't even original, but looks like it's been replaced with a screw. 
nothing but the finest tools here in Rundar's room. Since I don't want to accidentally open up a hole that is too large, I hold the end of the stipe up to the cap and make a mental note of how big I need to make the hole. If you want to be more precise, you could use a marker or pencil to trace the end of the stipe onto the cap. Don't you love the quality camera work I've employed here? Rundar, please try to keep the project in frame going forward. Repeat the process on all your caps. There is something very satisfying about this part of the project. Maybe it's because the mushroom is finally looking like a whole and really beginning to come together. What did I say about keeping it in frame? Note to self, hire an apprentice camera operator. A bit of hot glue or PVA in the socket will hold the stipe tightly in place. I like hot glue because I hate dry time, but if you don't have a hot glue gun PVA or tacky glue will work just fine. A little of video editing license here. When I was making the stems I took a minute to cut out a base from graphics medium weight chipboard. I know there are a lot of options for making bases for scattered terrain but for me this cardboard represents a nice compromise between cost, ease of use, and durability. I also like that it has a good bit of weight that helps lightweight foam builds stay put on the table. I start by sizing up the area the base will require by dry fitting the stems on the board. Then I cut a simple rectangle of board approximately the size I gauged out. Once I have the rectangle I use my scissors to round all the corners. I make sure to make the cuts blend well into the straight sides of the cardboard. I don't want any perfectly straight lines anywhere on this base. Another quick dry fit of the stems and I'm pretty happy with the size and shape of my base. Now that all the corners are rounded, it's time to take off the sharp edges of the base. This step is optional but it does help the base blend as there will be no hard edges to catch the light and draw attention to it. If you wanted to go a step further you could break out a heavier grid of sandpaper and really bevel the edges. I'm kind of a lazy crafter and a quick brushing with a nail file is good enough for me. For this step I highly recommend a hot glue gun. I hit the bottom of each stem with a healthy sized blob of hot glue and position it on the base, making sure that the caps are basically level. Remember a mini needs to be able to stand on the top of these. Okay folks, we're going to move fast through the last few steps. This is the part where things went a different direction than I had been planning. Here are the colors I used for the paint. 
Originally, I was going to paint these up with fluorescent transparent ink, but because I already have a pretty nice collection of glow-in-the-dark mushrooms, and because we are modeling this one off the Fly Amanita, I ended up using basic craft paints and a brush. You can see I painted the caps red with a fire red, then I painted all the scales with a light ivory. The stem and the gills of the cap were painted with a camel brown. The annulus was painted with bittersweet chocolate brown. Don't worry if it looks too dark we will dial that down with the dry brush. The gills were left all camel brown while I dry brushed the stem and the annulus with the light ivory. A bit of flocking on the base will blend the stems into the ground and make them look like they are actually growing out of the base. I spread a bit of Elmer's school glue around on the base and smooth it out with an old paint brush. A liberal dusting of my homemade flock is applied to the base over a cake tin cover to catch the excess flocking. This flocking is made by using my coffee grinder to pulverize some dry leaves I've collected around the neighborhood. I then add about the same amount of glue on the bottom of the base. This is an old trick to counter the tendency of cardboard to warp if glue is applied to only one side. This is spread out evenly and both sides are allowed to dry. Like magic the base will remain absolutely flat. Now we need to seal the flock. With just the glue on the base it's not going to stick very well. It will flake off and be a mess. Let's mix up some homemade scenic glue. Just mix a 50-50 Elmer's glue and water, stir well. Quite the secret recipe but we in the hobby have a way of overcomplicating things. Keep it simple. Not only are pipettes very useful for applying our scenic glue, but they can be used to stir up our mixture. A well-timed haste spell can make the stirring so much more efficient. This is a cheap spray bottle filled with IPA also known as rubbing alcohol. A nice spritz of IPA on your flocking will break the surface tension of your glue mixture and allow it to fully infiltrate the flock. With a pipette I apply small drops of the watered down glue. Because we use the IPA it will flow nicely and give an even coverage. Because I have a silicon mat I'm able to just allow this to dry on the desk. If you don't have a silicon mat use a small piece of parchment paper to sit your mushroom on to avoid accidentally gluing your project down. If you don't have parchment paper it's possible to build a drying base. Just take a small square of cardboard and drive a few thumbtacks through it at regular intervals. When you're done it should look a bit like the bed of nails you've seen circus performers lay on. You can sit your bases on the pointed tacks and because the point of contact is so small the base won't become stuck. Since we've clearly veered into the realm of the Feywild, I'm going to sprinkle some of my fallen leaves around to add some additional visual interest. I always find this part of a project the most fun. I feel like it's these little details that can take a project to a new level. I know I promised you Underdark Mushrooms, but sometimes the crafting gods have their own plans. While my mushrooms ended up belonging to the Fey, yours don't have to. It's all down to the painting, really. The inks I used on the more underdark looking mushrooms was a great set I found on Amazon. They are called Montmartre Acrylic Ink Premium 6 Pace Acrylic Inks for Artists Floro Colors. The coolest part of these inks is they actually glow under a black light which makes them look even more alien. 
I'll include the link in the doobly-doo. I can't wait to see what strange and exciting adventures my party finds deep in the Underdark. A few other random mushrooms and odd otherworldly fungi dropped on a simple UDT created with nothing but XPS foam, some simple flock and fluorescent inks really sells the illusion of this alien world. These giant fly Amanita mushrooms really look the part in a fey wild layout. Dropping in some of my existing forest scatter and a large foam fantasy tree and the scene transports you to the plane of fairies. So often when building modular scatter it turns out that we find multiple uses. In this case the same building methods have yielded a nice bit of terrain for an entirely different plane of existence. Will you build your giant mushrooms to populate the Underdark or the Feywild? Most often, I present my terrain on a round, ultimate dungeon tile, or UDT. I have a small plastic Rubbermaid Lazy Susan underneath to allow the players to rotate the whole scene to make planning their turns even easier. One of the most critical things we need to keep in mind with our terrain is playability. Tall or large terrain can easily obscure the player's line of sight. Allowing the players to rotate the world it's much easier for them to see how their mini is aligned to other players and the bad guys. You may have noticed we don't have any grids on the terrain. This is by choice and as it turns out isn't really a problem. Each base is about 1 inch which is 5 feet. Movement is simple to calculate by doing a heel toe count of the player's movement speed using the mini base as a kind of ruler. In most situations a careful guesstimate will suffice for spells and ranged attacks. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed following along with my process for making these cool scattered terrain mushrooms. If you've learned a trick or two along your crafting journey I'd love to hear about it down in the comments. I'm very new to YouTubing and who knows how many of these videos I'll end up making. If you would like and subscribe I'm sure that will help inspire me to keep making videos. Until next time go craft something and build your world.